Varmt välkommen till Rikets sammanskanalen på Youtube som handlar om allt som är roligt med privatekonomi. Vårt mål är att du varje vecka ska få konkreta tips, råd och inspiration för att ta din privatekonomi och ditt span till nästa nivå på ett enkelt och på ett roligt sätt. Jag heter Jan Bollmesson och detta är min fru Karolin. Hej! Idag är dags för avsnitt 291 och idag så blir det en intervju med två stycken engelska professorer. Och de har intervjuat 69 personer som jobbar inom finansbranschen, jobbar både på liksom sälj- och köpsidan, att de jobbar alltså både som förvaltare och jag tror att den genomsnittliga förvaltade summan var typ 140 miljarder kronor. Yep. Så att det är liksom inga duvungar. Och sen Nej. har de intervjuat analytiker och sånt som jobbar på banker och mm. etc. Och jag vet inte var jag hittade denna studien, men det var liksom så här, jag satt en kväll och så läste jag den och så bara så här, vet slö, tittade, läste abstract och, 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 och sen tittade och sen så bara så här, shit på en fritt, alltså här är citat liksom från så här, jag skulle inte investera mina egna pengar i min egen fond, yeah. jag har mina pengar i indexfonder eh, och liksom. Och detta kom från aktiva förvaltare. Ja, mm. precis. Eh, och de här professorerna tittade liksom på hela den här liksom investeringsvärlden utifrån mer ett människoperspektiv beteende, social konstruktperspektiv kan man mm. säga snarare än liksom så här, eh, perspektivet eh, kring så här, och vilken strategi fungerar bäst. Mm. Så att vi intervjuar dem här en timme och, och, och alltså, jag tyckte att detta var en fantastisk intervju. Ja. ja det var det också för att de, var, hade, de använde inte så mycket akademiskt språk ju. Ja. De var lätta att lyssna på tycker jag och eh, svarade jättebra på frågorna ja. så att man blev helt, man blev lite chockad ibland över liksom vad de hade hört ja. under de här intervjuerna. Ja. Alltså jag, jag känner så här spontant, nu kanske jag är lite liksom så här entusiastisk och precis avslutat intervjun, men jag känner så att detta är så här, man behöver bara lyssna på tre avsnitt på riket sammans. Man behöver lyssna på avsnitt 99, hur man investerar i forskningen, och sen behöver man lyssna på detta avsnitt och veta varför man inte ska lägga sina pengar i aktiv förvaltning. Mm, och sen man kan... får liksom en, en ytterligare en dimension ja, <clears throat> precis. i detta avsnitt. Och sen kan man lyssna på fyra hinkarprincipen. Och sen är du dan. Sen ja. <laughs> behöver du inte lyssna på någonting om investerande eller finans överhuvudtaget. Mm. Nej, jag tyckte det var, det var magiskt. Jag ser Vad fram- tog du med dig som, som stannade kvar hos dig? Nej, men jag gillade det som de sa. Liksom, vad, vad kan man ta med sig här förutom att... Alltså, för det är lätt att komma från detta avsnittet och tänka så här. Alltså folk i finansbranschen är, eh, som vi pratar, delusional och har liksom kognitiv dissonans. Men, alltså att de gör saker som egentligen inte stämmer överens med deras egna uppfattningar. Ja, eller vad det finns liksom vad det vet, finns, bevis för, ja, vetenskapliga precis. bevis för. Mm. Men, det peng, alltså liksom så här, men jag är alltid så här, när jag pekar på någon annan så kommer det liksom tre fingrar som pekar tillbaka till mig själv. Mm. Och då handlar det om så här, så vad kan jag göra annorlunda? Eh, och, och där handlar det om att inte gå på de här liksom mellanmänskliga alltså så här, eh, drivkrafterna som vi har att vi, vill, vi tror på hjältedåd och vi tror på att någon ska lyckas och vi har en övertro på egen förmåga och alla de här mjuka faktorerna att det är de som ställer till det ja, och, som, man, som man normalt kanske inte ser inom finansbranschen exakt mm. och, och där de också säger så här nej men, du vet, vårt, ett förslag är att se på finansmarknaderna utifrån ett socialt perspektiv ser det som att de som sitter på andra sidan också drivs av vanor och rutiner och relationer har lån och betala har lån och, och, och betala. privat skolor till sina barn och ja, och, och liksom mm. har så här nej, men den här personen kanske inte är så himla duktig men han har fru och barn så vi, vi, vi vill inte ge honom sparken utan mm. vi vill ju behålla den här personen mm. alltså all, allt det här liksom ja, men mellanmänskliga fina kan ja. jag uppleva men där jag ibland har trillat i fällan tänkt så här, Nej men eh, när jag var i akademin, nej men eh, i näringslivet då handlar det om pengar, då är alla så seriösa och, eh, och liksom rationella och sen tänkte man så här, nej men i finansbranschen, det handlar om jättemycket pengar, då är de rationella och tar rätt beslut och de bortser från de här mellanmänskliga driv- Känslor, känslorna och, och det och så bara nej. Och, och på, så på ett sätt och vis tyckte jag att det var ganska fint också. Yeah. Men bara för att det är fint så behöver jag inte bidra till det och förlora egna pengar. Nej. Liksom. Mm. Och rent konkret så pratar vi om allt från ESG, hållbarhet, aktiv, passiv, eh, liksom citat. Vi pratar om 
liksom skillnaden på professionella investerare, småsparare etc. Så att, mm. äh, jag tyckte detta är ett av mina topp äh, avsnitt ja, alla, alla tider. Mm. Äh, tog du med dig någonting sista innan vi släpper Nej, på men, dem? Äh, det var faktiskt en spännande grej att de forskarna hade då ställt lite frågor till de här aktiva förvaltarna och sen hade de fått svar på helt andra saker och då sa de så då ska man lyssna, det får ni höra om i avsnittet. Ja men precis, för deras mål var ju inte att svartmåla finansmål eller mm. prata om aktiv passiv utan de ville egentligen göra en annan studie och sen mm. var det detta som dök mm. upp det i var Sverige. spännande. Så att, äh, äh, och det är så här, de pratar engelska ja. och den ena pratar till och med lite så här med dialektal engelska. Eh, så att avsnittet här är i sin renaste form på engelska och det finns eh, textat på Youtube och eh, det finns även en transkribering på bloggen. Så för dig som tycker att engelskan är jobbig så det finns andra sätt att ta det till dig. Så att, eh, det vill vi verkligen rekommendera. Så ett stort tack och sen tänker jag varsågod. Very welcome, Professor Crawford Spence. You're a professor at uh, of accounting and co-director of the Finwork Futures Research Institu- uh, Center at King's Business School in London. And among other things, you explore how technical innovation is disrupting financial professions, financial expertise, as well as your research has explored corporate accountability, corporate tax, professional elites, and expertise in financial markets. Welcome, Crawford. Thank you for having us. And also a warm welcome to you, Professor Yuval Milo. You are also a professor of accounting at the Warwick Business School. You are a leading contributor to the field of social studies of finance, and your research seeks to understand the social and technological processes that underpin valuation uh, by, among other things, examine social impact, securities, analysts, practices, and algorithmic trading. So welcome. (laughs) <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Do, Thank do, you. do you want to add something to the introduction? No. No. Oh, you oh, see? That's no. great. Yeah, <laughs> okay. It's, it's, it's perfect. <laughs> it's cool. So, Very kind. So before we delve into your study, that uh, that's the purpose of uh, this uh, podcast. So our understanding is that the consensus in academia is that an, a normal retail investor is often better off buying less cheap passive index funds than buying uh, like a, a few stocks or choosing an active managed fund. Uh, and I think you referenced several studies in just the background section of your paper. Would you agree that this is some, somewhat the consensus in academia? I hope you say yes. <laughs> well, I, I think it's well established across many different economic studies. But is it a consensus? I'm not entirely sure. I think this is what makes this area so interesting, is that there's very strong evidence to suggest people should not be giving their money to expensive fund managers, but you know they keep doing it anyway. And I think in business schools and other places, we keep teaching them things that you know make students think that this is a great area to go into. And we still create the illusions and fantasies that it's possible to beat the market. So I don't know if it's a consensus, but there's definitely some strong arguments and the support what we are trying to say. Yeah, yeah. There's a, the the whole, uh, j- just to add and kind of sharpen this, the, the whole profession or sets of professions that, that go around a fundamental uh, analysis in investing is based on rejecting what you just said, Jan, that you can make money uh, by being smarter than the market. So the consensus is, um, you know, is hotly, debated because a lot of people make a living from rejecting this uh, or aim to make a living from rejecting this yeah and why and uh, why do you find Ella, that this is such a like uh big I, i wouldn't say a fight but it's like two very strong different viewpoints how how come it like we don't have this in physics for instance or uh. in in other subject areas well, Should we go into that? That's a, that's our book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please do, like in in a short version. In a okay, short the version. short version. You, you're absolutely right, and and it's great that you came up with with science because really you have uh, a situation in 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 the knowledge uh, around investment that kind of, in a way, I mean, I'm not comparing now. My compare what I'm going to say now does not compare investment analysis to any any of the things that I'm going to say now. You will see in a second. But in a way, it's like 
uh, Western medicine and, um, you know, in faith healing. Okay, healing, uh, I don't know, homeopathy, uh, all kinds of, of areas like this. So they are really fundamentally, they do fundamentally disagree on on what knowledge is and, and the, on the nature of the phenomena, right? So efficient market hypothesis says that, you know, all, all relevant information is already incorporated in the price, <laughs> while there are people who basically say, no, we do fundamental analysis, we understand better than the market is. So they actually treat, you see what I'm saying? Like like a doc, one doctor would say, yeah, well, I'll do some x-rays on your body and understand it. The other one would say, oh, I'm going to call the spirits and the spirits will guide me through. So very different ways of looking at things. Yeah. And and I find I find this very, very interesting. And we will come into that because that's kind of what you write in your paper as well. Because if I would go to a doctor and the doctor say, well, here is an established uh, a science way to do things, this uh, heart surgery, but you know what? And this is actually what, uh, uh, what the fund manager said to me. I want to give myself the uh, opportunity to beat the market. It was like if the doctor said to me, I want to give myself the opportunity to do this in my way, like... I wouldn't kind of accept it. Uh, I would like, no, please do the classical heart surgery on me, please. Uh, what do you get? What do you think? That, that, that's interesting because a lot of people, I think, would say the opposite. You know, particularly when you look at retail investors, yeah. they, they, they really spend a lot of time not making any money generally, but mm. under this illusion that it's possible to beat the market. And they really yeah. think it is possible. And, and of course, it is to some extent you look around and there are some people who manage to do it so you think well it must be possible maybe i can do it or oh, clearly the market is not 100 percent efficient because it does these wonky things you know and maybe you get in there you do some trades and you make some money over the course of a couple of weeks and you think well i just keep this going if i just work hard enough and absorb enough information and that's how that's how people get sucked in to this area particularly in the sort of retail space so you're very rational, Jan, obviously, right? But not everybody is rational. Yeah. Uh, well, and I, not, I, certainly not 100% of the time. So. Yeah. I, I would say I'm rational. I'm going to let you in, Kerry. I would say I'm rational because I spent 25 years investing as a retail investor, and the first 15 years I just lost money. After, or I realized <laughs> that I didn't beat the index. Yeah, yeah Carol, you would. Yeah, but it's also um, depends on how you look at it because uh, there is some conservatism going on uh, everywhere. I read that if you're uh, studying to become a nurse in Sweden, you get all this new science um, information that yeah. you can do this and this, and this is how you treat a, a wound and so on. And then you go into the hospital to work and they just do it the old ways. Yeah, that there's yeah, that's... some inertia. Yeah. And, yeah. and and that it was maybe it's, isn't it kind of behavioral? Yeah, well, we think it's beyond behavioral. So there's a big area that you, you're obviously well aware of, Jan, and you've talked about this yeah. on your podcast before to do with behavioral finance. Yeah. And that is a welcome innovation on traditional finance. It looks at how people sometimes make irrational decisions. They're not perfect at processing information. They have biases. Actually, our argument is that it's not just to do with the, that individual cognition level. It's more of a wider social phenomenon. So, so the argument that you're making, Caroline, is absolutely appropriate here, and it's a really good parallel, because what we are trying to say with fund management is really a basic sociological argument. It's that fund management is no different from nurses in the healthcare service. You know, we, we feed people these ideas of dynamism and innovation from economics, but in the real world, it doesn't always work like that. People work on the basis of habit. They work on the basis of routine. They work on the basis of inertia, you know, and um, just what things are, how things have always been done. And financial markets are no different from, you know, nurses. Then it's no different from real estate. It's no different from lots of other fields in society where things are done on on that basis. So it's it's no surprise that you know really some new ideas will come in that show that, show that what people have been doing for a long time doesn't work, but they yeah. continue doing it anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And be, and just I just I just want to add to that because financial markets are interesting. Absolutely, as Crawford said, you know, people do that. It's a social uh, social activity, institutional activity. Why should it be different from medicine or 
art or any other thing that people do. But the, the additional bit here is that we have a theory that you know was developed in started in the, in the 1950s that's called official market hypothesis that that basically says kind of the rationality that Jan was talking about refers to that right you cannot be the market you might as well put your money in an index but people resist it all the time and this kind of goes deeper people resist it all the time because it takes them out of the picture hmm. there's no there's nowhere where you can be a star where you can be a hero where you can tell your stories, oh, you know, this is what I did, and this is how I yeah. beat the market then and there. And that's the same, it's kind of the same logic, social, societal logic behind lottery. You know that your your chance is very low, but you say, why not me? Maybe this week it will be me. I'm going to put my money there. You see what I'm saying? I'm going to get lucky, maybe. Uh, so so it, there there's some magic, some attractiveness to a story where you do something, where you have agency, and it's not just random movements in the market and this i think what drives uh fundamental analysis yeah yeah i, I think that there's also like a famous study that's repeated every now and then in sweden about uh, car drivers and it's they ask uh, the drivers uh, are you better th or worse than the average driver yeah, and, yeah. In <laughs> and, in, and in sweden we only have three percent of the drivers that are worse than the average driver <laughs> <laughs> and and I think it's kind of the same phenomenon. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I think yeah. every every country does this study, and the percentages are slightly different, but everyone is above average. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and fund managers as well, you know. I mean, yes, eighty percent of us don't beat the index, but you know, I'm one of the twenty percent. And everyone you speak to says that, and you sort of think, well, where is this other eighty percent exactly? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, uh, like a month ago, uh, in early 2023, uh, you published a paper called "Active Fund Managers and the Rise of Passive Investing: Epistemic Opportunism in Financial Markets." And you wrote this with your co-author James Valentine from uh, Marquette University in Wisconsin. And here is our first uh, question actually from the community, from Melva. And she was like, so why did you guys find it important to do this study? I think because so much money is going into active fund management. And, you know, I mean, I, you've always been looking at this much longer than me, but I first started looking at this sort of five, six, seven years ago. And, and I was just astonished to see those those figures, whether it's the Spiva figures or figures from Morningstar or wherever, which just show how many active fund managers underperform the market, uh, underperform, don't beat the index. And it, it, for me, it just raises a question in my head, which is, well, why does this situation persist? And those people that are in the active space, what do they tell themselves on a daily basis? So I just thought those those were interesting questions. That that's what motivated me. I don't know if Yuval has the, the same. Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I've been studying financial markets from from a qualitative perspective for for a while. Too too long to to, to care to remember. But um, um, the 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 sums of money are are really. Uh, impressive, but also the what what really keeps on tracking me to to the markets is the um, the fact that they are part of the the kind of if you like the cultural bloodstream. Everyone talks about things in terms of return. Everyone uses market language without understanding exactly what what are the underpinning uh, forces there, right? People talk about the supply and demand and profitability, even when they speak about something completely different. And I thought, right, this is the leading cultural phenomena of our time. We we need to keep on returning to this to understand where it comes from and what it really means. So this is kind of, if you like, the, the deeper reason. And of course, we're in business school, so it's it's in, you know, within our remit yeah. to study financial markets. Yeah. And w what would you describe if you each would take, what are the most important findings so far? So, uh, I mean, there's, we think everything we find is important and <laughs> talk about it until, you know, tomorrow. But, you know, a few highlights from my side. One is I think we demonstrate that the lack of faith that active fund managers have in their own domain and their own area of activity. I mean, if we have people turning around to us and saying, you know, I work in active fund management, but I invest all my own money in index funds, or people turn around and say to us, I wouldn't invest in my own fund. Those are fairly startling admissions. And, and they really display that 
people don't have faith in, in what they're doing on a daily basis. And then we ask them, well, why do you do it then? And, you know, they say, well, it's well paid um, or, you know, it's interesting. It's stimulating to do this stuff. We may not beat the market, but, you know, yeah, A, I'm getting paid to do it. And B, it's intellectually super, super interesting, you know. And, and those are all sort of understandable explanations. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think for me, that's that's probably the headline thing that jumps out. I don't know if you, Val, you have any other nuances yeah, you want to bring out. This is what came, what came out. I mean, we suspected for a long time, and, and speaking with you, just to, to mention again, uh, the, 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 the person the, who gave us access to a lot of those interesting people that we, we spoke with and, and gave us a lot of their time is James Valentine, who's been a sales head analyst for, for I think, think 20 something years so he really has a lot of contact uh so uh yes this is what i found interesting as well but i just want to kind of dig slightly deeper because it is really interesting people tell us you know i wouldn't invest in my fund because this is really now i'm paraphrasing they didn't say directly they say oh this is something for rich people so it became kind of a you know an, an intellectual pursuit some kind of a 19th century gentleman's uh Thing. You know, people used to go to the, I don't know, whatever, to, to the North Pole. Now they they do uh, active Ted. investment, right? It's kind of a, I wouldn't <laughs> say an extreme sport, but it is, it stopped being only an economic thing or less so because, you know, the FTSE 100 or the S&P 500 will give you better results. You better put the money there. So why do you do it? Crawford said this is kind of a a, a pastime activity. Like, yeah, 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 because, 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 yeah, because the, f the first thought is that they are delusional, but there's always a, a method to the madness, um, uh, mm. uh, I would say. And, uh, uh, what would you and but because when I read your study, I was like, I was like, okay, I, I know this, I, I, I've like observed this, um, uh, how do you say this behavioral thing when I met angel investors. And mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, and I was very like, I wanted to become an angel investor and I talked to them and I invested my own money. And I just like for several years, when I uh, went back and looked through the numbers, I realized I lost money. And I, I went to the other guys and I was like, do you guys make money? Uh, and, uh, and, and I realized they don't. And I was like, okay, so why are you in this community? But then it was like you said, it was a gentleman's board. They were on the boards. They got mm. people asking them questions. They learned they, stuff. They learned yeah, stuff. They could give back to the, to the society. Yeah, but mm. when you asked them why they were doing it, it was for the return. So, yeah, so, so it's kind yeah. of a, sh you know, so, and, dissonance. <laughs> yeah, and is it that yeah. they, yes, yeah, yeah go. No, the, the, the dissonance, dissonance is a great thing because actually there's no one simple explanation for it why anybody does anything. There's always more than one reason. And then there's always the ex post rationalizations as well. So say you undertake something, it doesn't work out. You're always going to find two or three reasons to explain why you actually did it. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, it was not about the returns. It was because, you know, I wanted to contribute back to society or whatever. I mean, was that the original motivation? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe this is just an ex post justification for what they've actually done. But we do find a lot of dissonance among the people we spoke to as well. So they both believe and don't believe that it's possible to beat the market. They know that index investing is the way to go, but they still retain some space in their head where they think they can generate alpha. So they're playing around with these different things at the same time. And I think, you know, the other series of findings that are in the paper talk to how they try and resolve that dissonance. Yeah. So you, yes, index investing is superior, but it doesn't do price discovery and it doesn't help the market overall. Oh, but who's going to do ESG or save the dolphins or save, you know, save the planet. Only we can do that. The active fund management community, which is a particularly hilarious claim really, when you think about it, but we can maybe mm -hmm. get into that later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's all these ways they can try and resolve that dissonance but there is a lot of psychological complexity there mm -hmm. definitely yeah yeah that would be fascinating to go into if you want because there yeah yeah let's let's go go, go into uh, that just just to add to to the to the mix in a, in, a, yeah. in, a, in 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 an earlier study i mean uh i i i interviewed and followed um many hedge fund managers and many of them uh express hatred to what they do they really dislike what they do and they keep on saying, can we use uh, strong language? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Many of them told me about the practice that they have that they call fuck you money. Fuck you money is basically the money you probably heard about it in yeah. the investment community, that money that they put aside when to a kind of kept aside for a situation when somebody would ask them to do something they really don't like and they could say, fuck you, I'm going. Mm -hmm. Uh, and but the thing is, and this is what the, talks to the dissonance that that the Crawford talks to. Um, uh, I spoke with them over time, you know, kind of followed them around for for years, and they never use it. You know, the fucking moment mm. never comes. They keep on staying there again and again. Yeah, and I keep yeah. on asking, "You make more money than you could possibly ever spend. Your grandchildren couldn't spend it." Say yes, but I'm still not really fulfilled about this do you still hate it yes yes i can't, <laughs> I can't stand it so you see it's it's really weird it's really yeah. weird yeah oh yeah Crawford, where are you going come in uh no no yeah yeah and how, how come i like what's behind this what are the psychological drivers that they ha have this hatred but they still stay in it what would you guess? I could well, so I mean, so <laughs> people get tied into big mortgages and certain lifestyles, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and very few people who are earning the sort of money that is flying around in, in the fund management area, um, you know, live a sort of very conservative, you know, modest life. They get sucked into, you know, um, you know, fine wine, good cheese, and you know, and splashing the cash. So it's it's very hard to walk away from. Um, I mean, think about how how many areas the mains in the world pay you so well even when you underperform you know you get your money from fees rather than for, for, for performance generally it's all about how many assets you have under management rather than how well you manage them you know most other domains in society are performance related to some extent um you know so it's it's you know it's a sweet deal for a lot of people so to expect them to walk away from it um is probably unrealistic yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all that everyone mm -hmm. keeps a fuck you money um, and nobody walks away from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you can see that yeah, well, just about the, the, the point. Even people who, who ostensibly don't like a, a lavish lifestyle gets, it gets sucked into that. Because, for, for example, I'll give you an example from, uh, I remember vividly a hedge fund manager sitting in, um, they, they were doing, um, they were following potential mergers. So it's a strategy that follows a potential merger, and then they 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 basically gamble on the on the likelihood of the the, the merger happening. And as part of that, they have a lot of face to face meetings with you know with the ones the different sides of the merger. And I was sitting in at the back. You know, they were having the meeting, and I was just taking notes and listening. And then the 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 other guys. Uh, left the room and they were from a potential buyer and and I told uh, I asked the, the hedge manager so what do you think about them and they said I cannot respect them I said why I mean they, they make perfect sense he said did you look at their watches they were wearing some some cheap plasticky things these are not people we can really <laughs> so you know they, they so they had enough money to buy Rolexes but they wouldn't for yeah. some reason they were not respected so you see it's kind it becomes a signal of seriousness that you can actually yeah. spend some money. Yeah. So just yes. one example. There were many. Yeah, yeah def but. definitely. Mm -hmm. But how come? If if because it's easy to like point the f uh, finger at the at the fund industry and kind of laugh at them that they're mm -hmm. kind of cognitive dissonance and they're delusional. But I, I would say, what are we doing that are pointing at them? Because if you point yeah. at somebody, you have three fingers pointing back at yourself. What's yeah. what's our role? Are the community's role or the pension funds or the yeah. other we, we with the money? But well, this this really needs to be our next study, which is why so many yeah. pension funds and individuals keep giving the money to mutual funds. You know, why does Vanguard not have more money under 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 management, really? And you know, we, we can only speculate on that just now. I mean, some things we do know straight off the bat is that particularly in Europe. Um, there are still a lot of incentives for individual investment advisors to direct their clients' money towards uh, mutual funds and active funds in general. Um, that's not quite the same in the US. So the shift towards passive in the US, I think, has been much more aggressive because the way in which investment advisors are incentivized is a bit different. Also, there are more, it's more tax efficient. I think the way in which the tax system is set up in the US to invest in things like ETFs. So that the sort of institutional <laughs> context surrounding this 
needs to change a little bit to make it more um to, to change the economic incentives for people to move towards it there are still some some barriers in place but you know beyond those barriers there are always going to be people who entertain these illusions that they that they can beat the market or that someone that they appoint can beat the market on their behalf mm -hmm. so i don't see how that will change you know i mean we do anticipate more flows towards passive funds uh, in the foreseeable future but you know th there's always going to be some core of active funds out there still in the snake oil mm. yeah and and that kind of links also to to what we said before about the kind of the the myth of the hero uh mm. that's one and secondly this is an interesting point that that we no nobody speaks about that much uh nobody speaks that much about is that uh, uh the the active um trading introduces some new ideas into the market i mean they are right about it mostly they mostly those ideas are not very good but replicating existing portfolios so you so in in, in tracking funds and all that does not really add any uh intentional movement to the market right you just keep on buying but the mistakes that or you know brave mistakes let's call it that active fund managers make cannot introduce movement to the market you see what i'm saying they 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 they, they present it as a, as a positive thing look we, we provide for price discovery no not really you provide noise but noise is interesting mm. because it it it, it uh, um attracts other people to enter the market and so on so if, if everything is replicative then you're gonna have some weird uh movements that don't follow anything right mm. Mm. If, if this makes sense, I, I can go yeah, into yeah. the technology. Yeah, like if you if you go because that's uh, that's the like the most common um, uh, argument against the passive uh, uh, passive investing. It was like I think by Michael Burry that if yeah. everybody would invest in in index funds, you wouldn't have any price discovery. Every IPO would get valued as Apple, and uh, like you had this. Uh, how, how, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I think, you know, that's that's probably true, but, you know, it's also a false sort of case that's being presented because we're never going to have a situation where we have a 100% index, you know? I mean, no government is going to regulate uh, active investing completely out of the market. Um, and, and some of the arguments around price discovery have merit to them. I suppose the issue is, do we need to be paying, you know, Two percent and then twenty percent for you know to to for outperformance to people in order to provide that function, and do we need to have fifty percent of assets under management managed by active people in order to achieve those things, or could those figures be radically different? You know, do we only need you know twenty percent of the market to be actively managed in order to achieve that, or um, do we need you know and certainly fees need to be compressed a lot more as well. So, you know, I think, you know, that there's merit in those arguments, but, you know, it's the whole idea of 100% passively managed economy. It doesn't really make that much sense. Yeah. Mm. Um, it, it, it's, it's, I, I agree. And that also the, the, the political argument about the, the level of fees, of course, is, is uh, the debate should be out there. The, but really, if kind of, if we could talk about quality of price discovery, it has gone down. A lot because events that have got nothing to do with the, with the let's call it the fundamental value if we believe in that of of companies move markets much more than such events. So um, changing the composition of the S and P five hundred is going to move the markets much more than let's say some uh, some interesting news about Tesla mm. because just because of the sizes involved, right? Mm. So uh, I in 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 this particular. Uh, uh, element I really support the 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 kind of the knowledge uh stand of the active community mm. right? they react to to economic events rather than to some institutional movements yeah yeah uh Prof Professor Spence, you were saying it was like there's a claim in the active uh, community that okay, we do the ESG who's gonna save the dolphins and you said that yeah. there's it's actually a hilarious claim. Could you uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, where is the track record of of you know sort of the of financial markets and making the world a better place? I mean, all the stuff we're talking about is actually, from a social point of view, deeply problematic. Um, I mean, finance effectively operates as a tax on society. 
Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it takes money out of the markets. It takes liquidity out of the markets. I mean, if 80% of trades that take place today are, are high frequency trades, you know, this is, this is pure speculation. All that serves is to leach money out of the market, out of people's retirement and savings accounts and into, you know, the world of high frequency, the pockets of high frequency traders. And, you know, your paper is not really about HFT. It's about mutual fund managers and hedge fund managers. But, you know, the, the same goes there as well. You know, they're there just, you know, basically capturing rents from other people in the form of fees rather than performance. So that's a real problem. And, you know, one of the justifications for doing that, our research shows, is that, well, you know, if it wasn't for us, nobody would be putting pressure on companies to improve their corporate governance uh, or to improve their ESG. Of course, this used to be called CSR or sustainability or other things, but now, now they've changed the acronym and apparently we should all take it more seriously. And I just think there's very little for us to, to take heart from. Yeah, I think the track record of the fund management community and putting pressure upon companies is, is really very limited. And, and actually index, big index providers have big engagement teams now as well. Yeah. So there's the, the evidence doesn't show that the active fund management community are any better than, than passive investing vehicles in this regard. And actually, this is, this is just not the role of financial markets. You know, if we're placing all our, our, our hopes and dreams in fund managers to save the planet, then you know we're going to end up in a Mad Max scenario much quicker than we previously thought. You know, this is the, this is the role of policymakers. If you want companies to behave better, you're not going to add, you know get people who are incentivized, you know, to maximize returns to go out there and force companies to behave better. You know, you need to change policy. You need to change regulation. You need to change laws. Mm. Um, just about the the ESG kind of, if we want to be cynical about this and or realistic okay let's put it this way uh the the claim that an active uh fund manager would would change the minds of i don't know whatever shell or bp to become greener is a <clears throat> bit um you know i wouldn't say delusional but a bit um optimistic because what is the size of your holdings and how long you're going to hold them for right mm -hmm. so they know what whatever strategy you have you're going to hold over tens of tens of millions and you're going to hold them for about a month and then you're going to sell it right relatedly but if you if you're a tracker if you're uh, um your blackrock or, or vanguard you're holding them for a long time and you have a big holding so if they come to you right somebody like uh like blackrock and says right we don't like what you're doing in the arctic they're going to listen more I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with Crawford that they're like, you know, relying on these people to to save the planet is, you know, is a is a favorite dream. But but really the the, the big trackers, just because they are the big uh, you know behemoth of, of the market, uh, can actually change the the minds of, of big companies. Because if they pull out from, from a company, if they if for example, it will make headlines everywhere if if somebody like BlackRock or Citadel with the with the trackers would would go to to oil companies and said, you know, we can take the heat of not of not holding you because we don't like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. At the very least, I would see them, you know, <laughs> putting out some some frenzied um PR. Mm. Yes. Right. But yeah, some hedge funds do that. Yeah. They will say, OK, bye bye. But, mm. but it's also important to recognize that this is sort of um, culturally specific. So we spoke mm. to half of our interviewees were from the UK. Half of them are from the US. Yeah. And, and nobody in the US was talking to us about ESG. Right. It was all, all these arguments were coming out of the UK. And, you know, it's more of a European phenomenon. This And actually, just now, there's a big backlash against ESG. In, in, in the US, there's some, there's some controversy around there. So, you know, from a sort of liberal progressive point of view, you think, oh, well, you know, Europe's more advanced here. You know, you've got those uh, Neanderthal Americans that don't care about the planet. And, you know, and I'm sympathetic to that view on one level, but actually when you analyze it, you know, um, what we have coming out of Europe in terms of discourse in ESG is very disingenuous mm -hmm. and possibly diverts attention from real change. So if people mm. think that the fund management industry have got this under control, you know, they're not going to be out of the streets protesting yeah, or, or asking for our governments to actually do something about, you know, reducing CO2 emissions. Um, that's not necessarily <laughs> happening so much in the US either. <laughs> 
But I think there's probably more honesty among the US fund management community because they, they don't claim to be doing this stuff. They don't claim that's part of their remit. And I don't believe it's funded, it's really part of the remit of um of European fund managers either. I think it's just a, it's just a discourse that they've advanced to justify their position. It's a Hail Mary in the mm-hmm. in uh, you know, against the backdrop of underperformance, really. Yeah, exactly. That that's the view in Sweden as well. This is this is a way to market the funds when you can't yeah. market them on the performance. Exactly. Uh, um, when uh, when I read your uh, when I read your paper, you said that you had to co- coin a new term to capture what was going on with this dissonance and this delusion almost, and you called it epistemic opportunism. How how would you how would you explain this term? You even have it in the title of your paper. Yeah. So we, we played around with these ideas for a while. And, and first of all, you know, our original idea was epistemic stasis, you know, because they, they, they come up with the same ideas to new problems. This new threat of passive investing is growing. How are we going to respond to it? Oh, just by saying, just by doing the same stuff we've always done and coming up with the same arguments we've always, we've always uh, come up with. And to some extent, that is true. But, you know, we, we thought about this and reflected on this and we realized there was something more dynamic happening here. Um, you know, and so an attempt to try and resolve that dissonance we were talking about earlier is to advance this kind of opportunistic discourse, which is kind of like a scattergun approach. You know, we we just see what's going to stick or we throw a few arguments out there and see what's going to hit something. And, you know, one of them is the ESG, you know, which is very opportunistic, self-serving discourse. The other one is price discovery, which, you know, there's some merit in that, but as we've discussed, I think we can debunk that to a significant extent. And then the other one we've not talked about is, you know, well, bring on the bear market. You know, yeah, fine. Passive has eaten us alive because there's been a bull market for the last 10 years. But, you know, when things start going south, you'll see that we need the hedge funds. Well, you know, things have been going south for the last year. And the data now shows pretty clearly the active fund management community, whether it's mutuals or hedge funds, are really still being outperformed by index investing. So, you know, these different arguments, you know, they're all, you know, highly debatable. You know, they, we think they can be debunked pretty convincingly, but they're advanced all the time in a very opportunistic fashion. So it's opportunistic and it's a self-serving discourse. And, you know, the epistemic thing is that it's saying, you know, our, our knowledge base is still as relevant as it ever was, really. But, as I, but the, short, the short answer to your question, Yanis, why did you come up with this phrase? Is because we need to come up with new ideas as academics. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we sell. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This, is, this is our snake oil. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the kind of, just to frame this, this is, this is not what we do exactly in our research. And, and mm-hmm. there are others who do historical uh, studies. But kind of, again, having been in, in this, in this, in this uh, area of research for quite a while, I think in the last... I would say maybe yeah, 15 years, uh, the, the, the active has been really given a challenge because, uh, because passive has existed for a long, long time, but there's a kind of nice constellation of, of factors that really put them on the spot. Mm. Like, you know, the, the, the frequent crashes and, and, um, and the rise of the, if you like, the, the cultural accepted, acceptedness of automation and all kinds of other things that are really interesting layered together. And now they are left with, you know, kind of their, if you if like epistemic habitat is dying out. There are less and less excuses that they could sell mm. to show that they are superior. So gradu- I don't know what will happen. Of course, nobody has a crystal ball, but it looks like uh, they will now need to come up with something new. Wow. Mm. Did yeah. you feel like that they were relieved or, or happy that you were asking them? They were relieved to talk about this? I think, and you know, you probably see this in, from your podcast perspective. Whenever you sit and interview someone for an hour, they love to talk, right? <laughs> um, they really like to discuss their world, and and I think people don't sit them down for an hour or an hour and a half and and ask them about what they're doing, why they're doing it. Mm. Most of them are just out there trying to trying to you know invest in funds or do analysis or whatever. So I, I think a lot of people find it quite interesting, and 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 I know the outcome of the paper is, you know, it's quite critical of this community. But, you know, we come away from every meeting having a really stimulating conversation with people. Generally, generally, they seem really nice with a couple of exceptions of the sort of 70 people we interviewed, uh, you know, almost uh, to a person. They were they were very pleasant, super bright, generally. 
you know, very stimulating. Um, and, you know, some of them more reflective than we thought. We didn't anticipate mm-hmm. people telling us so much about, you know, how much they thought index funds were superior to the sort of stuff they were doing on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Um, what that what that conversation did for them ultimately, I mean, an hour after they spoke to us, they were back there trying to beat the market, right? So probably not that much overall. Um, but, you know, we gave them a free therapy session. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I mm-hmm. thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but, but it kind of to come clean, we didn't go out there specifically to ask about active passive. It came from them. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. It, it came, mm-hmm. you know, this was something that was on their mind and, and they kept on justifying kind of their existence uh, in, in, in that world. So yeah. we, in a way, it kind of and ranges. As a, yeah. And as a researcher, sorry, Yuval, but as a researcher, yeah. when someone starts answering questions that you've not even asked them, you, you need to start paying attention to that. Right. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's so there's, there's, there's always something there. What, what is that telling us? So we we pivoted our study in a way to focus on this in much more detail. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so well, I suppose to answer your question, Caroline, if this came from them rather than us, um, you know, there's a catharsis there, I suppose, or, or some need to let this out. I mean, I, I'm not a psychoanalyst; I can't fully explain that. But on a psychodynamic perspective, I think there's something interesting going on there. Yeah. Yeah. What were the personal highlights with, from the interviews? What like uh, what has stuck with you? Because you interviewed like sixty nine people for more than an hour, so it's a lot of material. So what what mm. are like the golden nuggets for you guys? Ooh. In in what area? Yeah, <laughs> like so what, what? Yeah, yeah. But take it away. <laughs> well, there's I mean, there's some things we couldn't really put in the paper. I mean, people mm. telling us that they basically you know breached regulations and mm. you know. Um, you know, sell side analysts, for example, are supposed to say, oh, buy, sell or hold for stocks. More than one person told us, oh, we have a policy where we just don't rate anything as a sell, um, which is a, in the US is a breach of regulation FD um, yeah. and you know, could potentially be struck off a list or something um, for disclosing that sort of information. So th- that's interesting. We weren't surprised that that happens. We were surprised that people admitted to that. Happening. It's it's like an open secret. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But it's great to have someone confirm it, right? And okay, yeah. it's only like two or three people out of 69 that say that. But if two or three people out of 69 are telling you that, you know it's happening pretty much you know, across across the board. And mm-hmm. actually, you just need to look at Bloomberg and see the number of sales that analysts put on there, and it's basically zero, right? So yeah. we know that there are massive conflicts of interest in this community. So, you know, we, we got a little nuggets about that, that sort of, um, those sort of conflicts of interest and some of the, the, the sort of dirty work that goes on behind the scenes um, with financial intermediaries, which I thought, I thought was quite interesting. But then, but I suppose the headline stuff, just to repeat, it was, was that lack of faith in what they do. Yeah, um, um, uh, yeah for me, it was kind of, it kind of, it was uh, the, this element, but that's kind of more forensic and, and a lot of people, would tend to, you know, assume or, or suspect this goes in the in the, in the background. Uh, something that was that was more kind of sinister and and uh, for me was the self censorship. So when people compare themselves all the time to to the consensus numbers, and they don't uh, even dare present numbers that go against. Uh, the consensus, because even though the, their models and their and their rationale tells them, look, really, we we differ from from what what everyone else is saying, and the, and also that's supposed to be highly um, sought after, right? This is how you become famous. They dare not do it. They keep on checking and checking again their models, trying to find out where they went wrong, assuming that they went wrong. So yeah. for me, that was that was a bit that was that was a big uh, aha moment. Yeah. yeah, so they've they've got this, you know, this mantra to beat the market, but then they've all these social pressures and personal anxieties about following the herd so that they don't look that yeah. when if they're out of out of line when something goes wrong, they get a, a call wrong. So that's a kind of dichotomous environment that they operate in. And also a lot of people hire people they like a lot in this space. People yeah. that are like them, that have a similar cultural background. We know this from many other fields, which sort of explains part of the the underperformance as well. You know, they're not hiring people all the time on the basis of of merit or what they can do. They're hiring them on the basis of you know 
what they look like, what they sound like, and just because they've always been there. And, you know, we had people tell us, well, listen, you know, I know this guy's useless, but we're still going to pay him 300 grand a year because, you know, he's got a wife and kids in school. And, you know, you know, it wouldn't be nice of us to cut him down to zero. Yeah. Um, and this, that makes me think as someone who, you know, has a pension, well, that's great, isn't it? All my, all my, all my pension flows are going towards <laughs> these people who don't do very much. Uh, yeah. yeah, and, and this, this kind of, just the last point, um, yeah. it, we can see that the buy side and the sell side, you know, we think of them as, as economic uh, functions, but, the, but they're not just that. It's a social network that grows through the biographies of people. You know, you start yeah, as yeah. a very junior sell side and you find connections with certain buy side shops that you like. And they move up, you move up with them, and so on. Then 25 years later, when basically, you know, passive does so much better than what you can think of, you still maintain your little ecosystem. Why? Because they are your friends as well. You go with them to football matches. Uh, you share information. You know their kids. They know yours, and so on. You see, uh, this these are the kind of the, if you like, the, the living, breathing roots of inertia. Yeah. Yes. And conservatism and hurting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, actually, what, what, when I hear, hear you guys talking about it, I think that it's, it's, there are a lot of human. I, I haven't seen this human side of it with all its flaws. It's, it's yeah. about the relationships. It's about the, the human flaws that we, like, like Daniel Kahneman uh, yeah. uh, wrote about yeah. in Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. So they 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 are humans. They do all yeah. the human uh, human specific, uh, which we tend to overlook when we just want yeah. to look at yeah. one thing and then all yeah, of this is the 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 you know the breed no the the, the basis yeah. of yeah, it, the uh, complex question. Yeah, that, that I think that we think of the finance industry. They are oh, they are well paid. They're managing this. They're professional. They manage a lot of money. They are not suspect to all these stupid things that i do on my spare time <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah no you're right and you know what actually a lot of the stuff we find here is just very unsurprising whenever we present this to academics everyone says this is just like academia right <laughs> we, could, we could present the paper to a bunch of people in the hotel industry and they'll say oh this is like hoteliers you know i mean any you know, we talked about nurseries before i mean all these dynamics exist in every field the, the, the thing is why do we not expect them to exist also in financial markets yeah. Because our thinking of financial markets is dominated by economists, right? And, and economists know nothing about human behavior, right? They're very good at econometrics. They're very good at different, you know, running different software programs. They like to think they can pronounce on how humans behave, but they're probably the least qualified people on the planet to make these pronouncements. So actually, you know, you go in there with ask some very basic sociological questions and you find out, oh, humans don't behave like rational economic man after all surprise surprise so in some ways in some ways you know we're a bit bored by these findings because they're so obvious but we need to make those arguments because the dominant thesis within financial markets is all driven by economics which is a problem Hmm. yeah Yeah, exactly and in the paper i just sent you i don't know if you want to cut this out but in the paper i just sent you at the beginning you'll find you know song and verse about all this all the, yeah, all can the, can the can't you tell us about it? Because you said that this paper is actually a part of a we call it tower paper, I think. Uh, uh, no, we skip that. But uh, you call that this was uh, like a piece of a larger study. Can't you tell us, yeah. like, if we zoom out? So, what's the larger mm-hmm. study and what's the purpose of it? Yes, we've got these two papers. The one that we've talked about today, this them just published, and another one that's you know hopefully going to be published very soon. And we're coalescing these into a book, which is going to be published by Columbia University Press next year. And, you know, it's all based on the same data. It's based on the same interviews with the same people. It's just slightly different arguments. So the other paper, which, you know, Yuval has just sent you, is really talking about the the social environment within which the active fund management community operates and the social dynamics um, that drive their behavior. So some of that stuff we're talking about hiring your friends, um, you know, you you have these biographical ties. You grow up with people in the industry, so you keep hiring people that you know rather than people who might perform better. Um, and you're all this hugging consensus rather than trying to provide a distinctive opinion. All these are all sort of social norms and institutional factors that point towards conservatism in this area and stop people in this space being more dynamic. So there's inertia, there's stasis, there's routine, there's habit. 
and it all points towards really how financial markets need to be understood within a social context. Yeah, all economic mm -hmm. activity takes place within a social context. So you have all that human and cultural stuff that comes in and stops people acting as the economic theorists tell us they, they're yeah. supposed to act. And they act in different yeah. ways. And and what we, we offer more, more specifically here, just kind of again, this is this is old news in sociology, but we, we employ the, the concept of of field, which comes direct uh, originally from uh, from the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, and looking at, at people acting within and around financial markets as a as a field that, that produces, you know, uh, political discourse, um, maintains relationships, opens up, kind of it, it like really removes the blinders from from our eyes, because instead of just mm -hmm looking for where is the utility maximizing element here you're saying no it's not utility maximizing they follow routines they understand the world through practicing routines and 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 some uh tacit understandings of things like like we do in, in society why should we look at the profession the set of routines that happen in financial markets any differently then you start looking at markets very differently mm -hmm. right you see what i'm saying it's not it's it's not just the information that is important it's also prestige it is also um uh social ties and and so on now of course we're, we're not you know kind of re reinventing the wheel here people have done it many times in different areas but very little in financial markets especially uh on the very kind of open to the public side of of, of sell side alleys yeah, and I would say that the self view in the finance industry is is also would say that we are above that uh, mm. in, in some kind of, uh, because we glorify we have these billions you know these series and you you have the star uh, fund manager who has overperformed and you have the star mm. research analyst uh, and so yeah so and they're even part of the the moo moo movement and yeah. development of humankind forward yeah exactly <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so i think we get sidetracked when it's when it's money involved and uh, we we put it we glorify it uh, yeah rather or, than... yeah or, or we focus on the sort of limited number of people who do seem to have beat the market over over a, a long period of time and it's very small numbers and the longer the time goes on the numbers get even smaller um and we use them and we extrapolate their experience to, to the rest of, of, of the fund management community, but it's not representative at all. And even yeah. those guys who do manage to beat the market, we, we don't know if it's because they're skillful or because they're lucky. I mean, you know, they're great for 10, 15 years, and then we realize they've taken some massive risks, they've paid off, and then it all goes south for them at one point. Very few people have full careers in this space. Mm. Yeah, and, yeah exactly. um, just just adding to that and this is again kind of borders on the forensic but it but it really is important when you when you become a star analyst right uh in the last few few weeks i've been listening to to conference calls you know when they speak with with the, the managers when you become a star analyst it is also in the interest of the cfo ceo to give you prominence okay because they know that people listen to you Right. So it becomes a bit of a symbiotic relationship. Right. They would be happy to give you maybe uh, the one say inside information or anything like this, but kind of open up the doors and show they answer you. when you call. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In return, you are, uh, you know, uh, uh, using your your reputation to say smart things about them that are not too critical. Right. That's the, that's the price you pay. So you see, it's easier for you not to not to go very wrong with the company, yeah. unless the whole thing goes south, obviously. So as, yeah. as you move as yeah. you move up, this, it's, it's harder for you to. Sorry, yeah, but no, the, this ahead. leads this leads to all sorts of other problems and delusions as well. So yeah. you know, you have you've curried favor with company management. The answer when you call, as you say, Jan. So then, what happens then is you you think you've got superior access to information, right? So, but we, we ask them, so what do you get with a special relationship with the CFO? And they say, oh, well, we get no new information, but when I'm speaking to him, I, I know, I know from his body language, from his facial expressions, whether he's telling the truth or not. 
and, and we hear this time and time again from people. And and and, and I, I don't know about you, you Val. I think I think you. I think we've yeah. talked about this. So I think you're probably <laughs> the same view as me. We we sit there and we think, really, this is what you've got. This is your USP. You know, yeah. you can you know interpret somebody raising their eyebrow as an indication of whether or not they're going to beat the next quarterly earnings target. And you know, but that's it. This is we're back to you know the quack doctor selling the snake oil and the magic in the air. Um, and this is what we're paying the high fees for, that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 And it really is currency because even putting aside kind of, uh, I remember in one of the interviews, I think it was, they told us, yeah, we, we, we had some, some lectures by FBI people and they told us to, to they give us some, some toolkit to see how, when people lie and all that. So it goes into really ridiculous uh, length, but, but it's, it's also currency because a lot of those uh, analysts, would love to tell you that they met the CEO face to face. Mm. In our last meeting with the CEO, we heard this. And as we walked to the coffee table, th these are actual quotes from, from analyst reports. So they would love to give you some stardust. Look, we actually yeah. spoke with, with Tim Cook. We actually saw him preparing his yeah. coffee. And then in turn, to go back to one of your earlier questions, you know, why are we still giving our money to fund managers? Well, if you're sitting in a pension fund, you're under pressure to perform you're going to give your money maybe to somebody who has that superior access. You can turn around and say, oh, you know, I, I've met Tim Cook, right? So, so then to that, you're a pension fund trustee, you can turn around to the, the people whose money you're managing and say, you know, we do our due diligence, we hire the brightest and best and make sure that they're managing your money. So, you know, that's slightly speculation because we've not actually done those interviews, but I, I suspect there's a lot going on mm. there um, yeah. along that vein. In, mm. in, in the pension fund side that I know from, from a different area, and I, I'm i sure it happens, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it happens in, in other funds as well, kind of, it's a safe, it's a it's a way to keep your job, right? You yeah. don't get fired by being wrong with everyone else, right? No. So, so you went with a, with a reputable fund manager, of course, they didn't do very well because the market, you know, <laughs> was moving up and down as, as it does, but hey, you know, I went yeah. with, I don't, I'm not going to say names, but okay, yeah. with X. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, no it's like when I call it in management, like, oh, we used McKinsey, so it's not our fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not even McKinsey could save us. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. McKinsey yeah. effect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, just a few questions before we um, round uh, down. Uh, the, you also wrote about, uh, th I think, three defensive mechanisms, uh, that it was yeah. like strong identity uh, and like... R I think you wrote like one reaction entails asserting a strong identity which can rally previously disparate members of community together and offer a renewed sense of purpose. Would yeah. you like to say something more about that? So this is really the attachment to what Yuval was talking about earlier, which is fundamental analysis. Um, you know, so we were in there, you know, a big part of index investing is about leveraging technology at scale. It's really been made possible through technology. And, you know, we're going through some sort of technological revolution or significant evolution, at least uh, just now with big data and AI and things like that. So we were asking people about how is this disrupting your field? How are you taking on, you know, how are you responding to the movements in big data? Are you changing your analysis techniques, blah, blah, blah? Um, is that a way for you to compete with passive or index investing? And, and by and large, they said, uh, well, no. Um, what we do is fundamental analysis, which is really a world of small data. Um, and we're looking for little nuggets of information, individual pieces that nobody else has. Yeah. Mm. So I, I'm, a, I'm a transport fund manager. I specialize in the transportation sector. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll fly out to um, off the coast of Louisiana, spend some time with people who work on barges, speak to them about what's happening with the shipping channels and the, the cargo that's coming in and out. And maybe I'll find something interesting about, you know, whether Amazon is selling toilet paper to people in Hawaii. So, you know, so the supermarkets are not going to do so well or the ships, you know, so we're talking about little things here. And he's like, I can do this. Supercomputers cannot do this, but I can go there and do that, that heavy lifting and find that nugget of information, which my clients or the, the funds I work for are going to be able to act upon as actionable investment advice. 
So, you know, we, we had, you know, numerous examples of this nature. They sound really humorous, but they were all very but, idiosyncratic. But you know what? It sounds attractive. Like when you're telling the story, I'm like, yeah, yeah. But we've heard it. I, yeah, we've heard, we, we've heard well. it. Yeah, because we've interviewed fund <laughs> managers and they say exactly like we go to, we don't go to uh, like expos with other fund managers. We go to this expo with this niche and we meet uh, customers and suppliers and we talk to them. We don't talk to the finance industry. We do our own picture and uh, yeah. we have even stayed in the jungles of Brazil and fought with oh. tiger and you know you're wow yeah like so you get yeah, attract- but attractive uh, arguments <laughs> yeah they are mm-hmm. uh, they are and they're evocative right and there's a, there's a strong imagery they are so you, and you think yeah you're right a supercomputer cannot do that and you go away thinking well okay he's, he's working hard steadily working hard and he's doing something unique nobody else is flying down to look at toilet paper movements, you know, to Hawaii and barges off the coast of Louisiana. Um, but zoom out, right? I mean, where's the performance over a sort of five to 10 year period? And, you know, the data shows that it's just not there. So this stuff is obviously not that important. Nevertheless, they're very wedded to this. This is part of their identity. We live in a world of nuggets of information and small data and unique insights. Yeah, and we love a good story. Yes. As you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, it, and it rolls ba- it rolls back to to the to the cultural image that we 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 discussed before. You know the narrative of you're you're the hero. You're moving history. You yeah. find the, the the people behind the people behind the people who will give you the real, uh, you know, cause of yeah. things. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And then you said uh, another one was uh, you wrote uh, a defensive maneuver to is to delegitimize non-members' knowledge and establish boundaries between us and them. Yeah. And you, I think you even had some interviewees saying that there's a lot of uh, 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 under incompetent. incompetent people in the industry. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yeah. Average so they people. they do they do two things here. They mm-hmm. they they throw mud at two sets of people. They throw mud at the passive people. And say, well, you're just like dumb money, throwing money or whatever's in the index. That's leading to price momentum and wonky price movements. We are the clever, savvy ones who can engage in price discovery and effectively make markets efficient. That's 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 their argument. Yeah. And they, they even say we're a public good. Someone told us we're a public good for doing this, you know. Yeah. Um, and the second group of people they throw money at is basically themselves or their colleagues. And this is going back to the Swedish um, average car driver phenomenon, you know. So, you know, most people in this area are really, you know, incompetent, below average. Um, but actually, I'm not. I'm not one of them. Um, but then, you know, every everybody is saying that. So yeah. somebody <laughs> is going to be below average, statistically and, speaking. And, and they're also this is a kind of a, a nice uh, hybrid argument. They say that the the, the the fact that we have lower and lower quality of analysis is because of passive. Because there's passive, more money goes to passive, less money is going to active. Therefore, we have, uh, you know, we can recruit lower quality caliber of people, and we overburden them with work because they need to cover more stocks. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they have no less time to come yeah. up, you know, with with really important nuggets of uh, of information. They cannot go to the, you know, to the jungles of Borneo to find where. Uh, whatever the, the the beginning of the supply chain because mm. we cannot fund them, so it's all kind of it, it's all, it's all the way around. It's it's uh, you know it's passive's fault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> and then the final one was uh, you said also that communities can also defend their existing field position by making a practice inaccessible to others, perhaps by inscribing their worldviews into particular artifacts or practices. So that this is, I mean, this is the flowery academic language. You know, yeah. we, we have to speak in these ways to get published in academic <laughs> journals. But basically, this is saying that passive cannot do ESG. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. This is a practice area that passive is incapable of doing. Only we can do that. And of course, we've we, we've talked about how plausible this argument is yeah. already. Um, yeah. But that's 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 a standard thing that communities will do to to justify themselves. So that's that's it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the yeah. epistemic opportunism. Right there. Yeah. Uh, how how did you get a feel? How common it was that they didn't invest in their own funds, or that they had a majority in index? Or um, so this is uh, this is a minority of people that are being open yeah. in this extent, and we're not we're not asking everybody. Do you invest in? in uh, and I know in in the US there are numbers you have to report it to the SEC, but there were some like limits uh, there. So okay, 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so, so we never, but again, this is something yeah. that they offered up voluntarily. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like, you know, I'd say, you know, for 10% of people we spoke to were quite, were quite relatively open about this, um, yeah. which doesn't sound like much, but actually given that we're not even asking them that question, yeah. um that's that's quite a lot and and if one person is saying that that's already a lot yeah uh yeah we, we like we know this from experience in sweden as well we when we had the first uh fund robot like betterment uh, started oh. in sweden the the founder said that the first the money they received was from the fund from fund managers like <laughs> yeah, but maybe they wanted to test it yeah <laughs> the last no, one. No. yeah it, it, they, they were it, it were first one uh <laughs> here we got the question from our community head gbl has like so what would you say if your kids or a dear friend came and told you that they're becoming active fund managers <laughs> well i mean it could still be a good career option you know i mean hope hope springs eternal i mean i don't think it's a meaningful activity to engage in um the sad thing is you know so, well, everyone we speak to in this field is just super bright well educated capable of doing so much stuff but, and i always come away thinking you know you should be building bridges or doing heart surgery but you know the, the economic incentives for them to, to do what they're doing are much higher than those other fields of activity so mm -hmm. it's completely plausible that they remain there um you know Would would I be happy if my kids went in that aspect? Sometimes I come away from these interviews thinking, I wish I was doing what they were doing. Yeah, they paid about 12 times as much as I do. Um, actually, I do think they can sleep at night. Um, I mean, we, we go into academia because we thought this was meaningful socially, you know, but we all have mortgage stresses and worries and, you know, have to go on strike to try and get decent pay deals. You don't see any of that in hedge funds. So I suppose there's, there's a little bit of schadenfreude recognizing that, You know their 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 activity is getting eaten up by index funds all the time. But at the same time, you know it is interesting work. It's exciting. Mm. You know it's well remunerated, and there's always good for the foreseeable future. There's still going to be a sizable amount of people in that yes. space, yeah. definitely. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's my honest answer, really. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of, it's kind of a it's a, it's a sub sub question to the bigger question of automation. You know, quite a lot of you probably saw. You know, what is it called? Uh, chat pgt and all that recently that everyone is saying oh you know who's gonna write the reports yeah i, I don't know but but kind of just echoing what, what what crawford said and i think there's something deeper within us that want people to do meaningful things right you know the homo faber and all that and i think uh active fund management is just another expression of that of course there is yes. the economic side yeah. but like it's a way to express your your agency Mm. But we are talking uh, a lot in our podcasts about um, that you want to have the majority of your money in index, and then yeah. you can have some on the side, uh, learning money or playing in the mm. yeah to, mm. to get set to satisfy yeah. your other needs. Yeah, that you can. You, 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 <laughs> I think that the, that the good strategy for most people would be like separate the financial side. Okay, this I need to be able to retire. And this I have to to have fun, to have my war stories, to be yeah. able to tell to how learn. I lost a lot of money. You know, this stock went down 90% and this was a 10 bagger. And we, we need that. We need those stories yeah. uh, yeah. as humans, uh, I would say. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, maybe if you have spare money, then, then, then you have money to burn. And I guess that's fine. But, you know, Jack Bogle would always just <laughs> pick it all in index funds, right? I mean, Warren Buffett, the most famous investor on the planet, is you know leaving in his will that all his money has to go 90% into an index fund and i think the other 10% is in US oh, it's cash. treasuries yeah oh, cash. cash right yeah right yeah. So, so i mean <laughs> you know he he doesn't believe in active fund management either yeah. so uh, i think people are a bit different you know maybe yeah. some people want that little bit of what eric baltunas would call hot sauce you know yeah. and yeah. go with the etf and index for 60 or 80% and then leave some space for hot sauce on the side yeah. um as as you said But 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 just this, the thought that you know the financial markets supposedly the you know the temple of rationality are there basically to to satisfy some emotional needs is a bit of a heresy if you think to to our colleagues in, in the economics department. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, like two last questions: uh, Is there any other question that we should have asked that we missed? Uh, mm. I don't think so. I mean, I think mm. I think you covered a lot of it, and we went into some detail as well. Yeah. which is good and, and we even managed to expand beyond 
and look at the wider project, which is really about the social structures that support yeah. this. And I think you know one of the, one of the key headline arguments we're just trying to take away is that using economics to understand economic phenomena is going to take you to a very strange place intellectually. Yeah. You really need to take social theory and social science to understand financial markets. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, I I would say I don't think you missed any questions, but but kind of I want to tie two two strands here that you seem to to have. I think that if if people who listen to this podcast want to get some advice about their you know their investment, like they are they are day traders or something, I would say that they would do better if they understood the social structure of the market and those motivations yes. that we speak yeah. about. Right? They will yeah. they will they would potentially do better you know financially yeah so this is i think you've, you've you've done it really you know i saw the two strands there but kind of these are also it's part of the toolkit that that, that yeah, a good look, investor may have yeah look at it from from that perspective i think you have a uh, somewhere in the paper uh, i noticed it when i read it last uh, last night that you that you should say that financial markets should be seen from a social context mm. uh, yes uh, but that can be one of the impacts from your article, actually. Do you have other yeah. hopes for impact from this study? Um, I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, these sorts of things are generally directed at other academics. So that's great. We're now mm -hmm. getting a wider audience with, like, you know, this podcast and some other things as well. Um, it would it would be interesting to see how it lands with the actual fund management community <laughs> itself. Yeah. Um, so it would. You know, it'd be nice to go to some of their conferences and present some of this information. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I have done some of that before with some previous research, and you know, they're kind of unsurprised because obviously you're presenting their ideas, their discourse back to them. <laughs> so they're like, "Yeah, that's what happened." Um, but I, I, th I think, I, th I think they, they know what's happening better than anyone yeah. else does. I think the issue is we in academia and in the media and other places go away and represent what happens in financial markets in a distorted way. Um, because we, we expect it to happen according to certain, you know, economic theories or things like that, or or certain common sense understandings. Whereas whereas, whereas actually this sort of analysis exposes that, you know, it's a viper's nest of mm. conflicts of interest and um, dodgy incentives and, you know, old habits and routines. But the fund management industry itself is well aware of that. Um, it's everyone else that needs to be aware of it and then puts pressure on it to reform it effectively. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's like also one of my insights. It's it's like we can finger point at the industry, but still it's that we are giving them our money. So yes. it's, yeah. it's, we are kind of... Uh, we are enablers. Uh, like yeah, <laughs> we are kind of enablers. Uh, cool. We have uh, two questions that we always all ask all our guests. Uh, so, And the first one is, uh, now maybe it's uh, redundant when we're talking about this, but what's the worst financial advice that you've heard? Oh, or the worst okay. advice in the financial in, industry in, in in our in our studies? No, or, no, it's it's no overall. here it's here it's in general. Like yeah, I even so, ha I we even had one guest say like monthly savings. So you can say anything. <laughs> right. So the the, the 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 worst thing I heard, and I've seen this not from my personal experience, but someone quite quite close to me, uh, thought that they could take their old pension pot um, into their own hands and do much better. Mm -hmm. um than they were actually doing i mean the, the, the pension was been managed by an actively managed fund manager right but it, it was sort of doing okay and um, they took it into their own hands and you know through through a lot of it into basically three or four different companies high risk ventures in the developing world and you know they basically lost about 90 percent of it oh, so yeah. you know we we have some very negative things to say about the active fund management industry but it could be even worse if you take it out of institutional structures and try and do it yourself. Yeah, yes. Yeah. My, well, my <laughs> my example was 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 very similar. Uh, again, someone someone I know fairly well and asked me a few years ago, "What do you think I should be doing?" And I said, <laughs> "I said to him, you know, uh, we, we get uh, we had a long discussion along the lines of what, what we had here. We said we can make fun of of the active fund managers, but they really put in a lot of thought behind that." And he said, "Well, surely I can do better." <laughs> and you know, we're we're at that end. Not with with pension money, but 
the you know a lot i would say the worst advice could be uh something along the lines of yeah do some day trading what's the worst that can happen everything yeah yeah that, that but, would be a very bad advice i mean play with play with fake money for for a long time and see how deep the rabbit hole is yeah. Yes. That, that, that just I just gonna shoot in one question because now we've talked about the fu fun uh, fund industry, but now when we talk about it, like if you go to the retail investors, would you say it's like transferable or is is it even worse in the retail space? Do you have any opinions on that? Yeah, but, but, I mean the data shows that in the retail space, virtually nobody beats the market, and the mm -hmm. active fund and the institutional space, some people do, and um, it just you know not very many over time. Um, and and the potential for losses is probably even greater in the retail market as well. I mean, you know, the people we speak to um, in the institutional space are super bright, super clever, and fine, they're not beating their benchmarks, but they're not far off it, right? I mean, mostly they're not beating their benchmarks because they charge fees that are too high yeah. rather than, you know, they're not making reasonable decisions. That's not the case in the retail space. You know, the retail space, you have all sorts of crazy behavior taking uh, going on. So if even if these you know super bright guys that we are speaking to in the institutional space can't beat the market, then you know nobody else can really. And I think that's the key. That's the key takeaway. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm. I agree. I agree. Yeah, it's, it's, it yeah because the, 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 yeah, and that's that's my my view as well. Because it, it, even if in the fund industry you have like this compliance, you have the risk management, you have the use it uh, rules, etc. Uh, which you don't have on the retail side, so you can yeah, screw yeah. up uh, faster. Last question: Do you have a book that you recommend? And it can be—it it doesn't have to be about finance. It can be a, a non-fiction book or a fiction book. The Vanguard book was good that you that you 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 sent to me, Crawford. What one's that? The Bogle one. Oh, the, 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 so uh, yeah, Eric Balchunas, the yeah. sort of Bloomberg ETF guy, has just written a book called The Bogle yeah. Effect, which Bogle is about Effect. about Jack Bogle. We're both reading that just now. Yeah. yeah. Um. So that you know, that's that's pretty that's good. good. Um. And it offers very clear, accessible sort of a history of index investing, but also lots of great data, which just shows very starkly how active fund management routinely underperforms. And and people need to read that stuff because it still surprises me how many people I speak to who just don't know, mm. don't know how how much money has been wasted in financial markets on expensive fund managers who don't be the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a good book. Following this conversation, absolutely. Yeah. excellent. Thank you very much for joining our show. It has been like I I just looked at the clock. I was like, whoa, we have talked for more than an hour. It time flies. No. Uh, it's a privilege. It has, it, yeah thank, thank you. you very it's much it's been exciting it's been yeah, very right. interesting and and we hope that maybe we can invite you back when you've published your book uh, oh man that would be that would be that awesome would be lovely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. so so looking forward to meeting you guys again and have a nice day Thanks. thank you thank you so much thanks thank you, thank you.